Thank you for attending this virtual event organized in part by Word Up Community Bookshop alongside Community League of the Heights as part of the It's All in the Heights program. So Word Up, we are a, a bookshop and an art space run by local residents, many of whom are volunteers. Um, beyond our virtual events, we can be found at 2113 Amsterdam Avenue at the corner of 165th Street and Washington Heights. In person and online, we have hosted events for all ages and sell used and new books in English and Spanish. And you can check out those books at wordupbooks.com to place orders. And you can also now pick up orders um, from Tuesday to Friday um, from 1 to 5 p.m. So that's a new development. This year, we've partnered with the census to remind our community of how important getting counted is. Billions of dollars are at stake for New York, money that goes to schools, infrastructure, housing, and healthcare. So we encourage everyone here to take their census at my2020census.gov and to check in with loved ones to make sure they've filled out the census in their preferred languages. Also, because we're not open to the public for browsing at this time and don't know when we will be open again, we started a GoFundMe campaign to maintain our space and meet our obligations while closed, um, which is really important because it helps us do the programming that, um, that we're able to do like this. During this event, because this is a webinar style, I don't know if you've all tried this before, you can submit, um, you feel free to use the, to add comments in the chat panel which you can access by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your screen. However, if you have questions, please click the Q&A button also at the bottom of your screen and put questions there so they don't get lost in the chat. But, uh, yeah, uh, so now I would like to pass on the mic to um, Community League of the Community League of the Heights before we introduce our featured author and interlocutor for today. Thank you, Memphis, and thank you, Veronica, um, Ruthie, Serena, and Cynthia for, particip for participating in today's event. My name is Jackie Tessman. Um, I was, until recently, a project manager of the Community League of the Heights. Um, if you're not familiar with the organization, they've been in Washington Heights for over 60 years. They provide multiple services for the community, affordable housing. They have a very, very active pantry these days due to COVID. They're still giving out 200, 300, 400 bags of groceries a day um, to community members. They have an after school program. They operate um, a high school called CHA. Um, my program was, is, excuse me, still, um, commercial revitalization, and um, it's meant to support our small business community on Broadway and St. Nicholas. We are fortunate enough to be able to continue with these book clubs um, throughout the fall into the winter with the help of our grantee LISC, Local Initiative Support Corporation. So for that, we're grateful. Um, and just a word on, on supporting small businesses. It is, you know, we have Veronica's a small business, Serena's a small business, countless of small businesses have been drastically affected by COVID. Um, and many are shuttering their stores. So it's now, it's important, more, it's more important now than ever for you to spend your money locally. When you spend your money locally, you keep your you know, your corner bodega, your corner grocery store, your corner bookstore open, you keep people employed and you keep food on the table for community members. So, um, you know, please remember to spend your money um, in a local business. And with that, that's the end of my, uh, my cloth pitch. And I turn it back over to Veronica mm -hmm. or Memphis, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, that's all right. So well, now we're going to begin the exciting part of the program. We have a lot on the program today and we'll be beginning with a conversation um, with Serena Prabasi, author of The Coffee House Resistance, and our interlocutor, Cynthia Pong, who also has a new book coming out, which we'll get a shout out, Don't Stay in Your Lane. Um, so I'm just going to introduce the two of them to get that started. And later we'll have a Q&A, so please remember if you have questions to put them into the Q&A um, box at the bottom of the screen. So a little bit about Serena. 
Serena Barassi has lived the life of a global nomad and is a new American. She was born in the Netherlands to Nepali parents and was raised in India, China, and Nepal, after which she spent formative years in the United States and in Ethiopia. Serena is a seasoned leader in international development, working on global health, education, water, and sanitation for over 25 years. In 2011, she moved from Addis Ababa to New York City and started Booney Coffee, which has really nice coffee and also nice matcha lattes, with her husband. Uh, their small business has become a hub for community conversation and action. Serena is also the proud mama of two daughters who keep her learning and laughing every day. Um, so I'm really excited to, and I, I, I was excited to read your book a couple years ago, so I'm excited now to, to hear this conversation. And the person who will be interlocuting for us today is Cynthia Pong, who is a fellow Word Up collective member. Um, so a little bit about Cynthia. Uh, she is a feminist career strategist, speaker, and author of new book, Don't Stay in Your Lane, The Career Change Guide for Women of Color. An NYU trained lawyer turned career coach, she's on a mission to empower women of color to get the money, power, and respect that they deserve. Her career advice has been featured in Refinery29, Huffington Post, Supermaker, and more sites, and she's a LinkedIn top voice for job search and career. Cynthia is a proud introvert, a classic middle child, and an unapologetic Rottweiler enthusiast. Very unrelatable, but I like that for you. <laughs> so I'm going to pass the mic on over to them. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, wait, I thought Serena is I now the part reading. where you're going to do the reading, but I can also do a little intro if you all would like. Um, so I have the honor of um, interviewing Serena today, who I first met when we did a book event, when WordUp staffed a book event for her excellent book, The Cassian House Resistance, which has the best subtitle, in my opinion, Brewing Hope in Desperate Times. It came out last year, but it is even more relevant now, I think, than even we thought back then. Um, but what I love especially about Serena is how how she writes so richly about community and what that has meant to her um, in the course of her life from growing up across four continents, spending formative years as Memphis said in Addis and then coming to New York and how she has reformed that here um, despite arriving uh, with a few suitcases it sounds like uh, a spouse and a very tiny baby at the moment. So um, I think Serena is going to read for us two excerpts from the book, after which I'll pop back on and uh, ask questions. Again, as Veronica and Memphis said, please put any questions in the chat or the Q&A box. I'll be happy to ask them on your behalf a little bit later. So um, I'll hand it over to Serena for you to hear a little bit of this excellent book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia, Word Up, Cloth, everyone for um, organizing this and for the opportunity. I'm gonna read um, two short vignettes from different parts of my book. And, uh, and then I look forward to um, talking more with Cynthia. The first uh, one I'm reading, and this is um, when we are living in Addis. We are in the same house, in the same living room, overlooking the front porch and the garden of verdant greens beyond a kaleidoscope of flowers and bottle brush trees swaying gently in the afternoon breeze. This time, a dimple-thighed and still wobbly Juni is playing on my lap. My other mother-in-law, Elias's birth mother, Alamgana, is staying with us. It has been an emotional visit. Elias getting to know his birth mother for the first time since he was a small child of four or five years old. I practice my Amharic with her every day, but have trouble understanding her sometimes. I'm so used to the urban Addis Ababa Amharic of my work colleagues and Elias's friends. Alamgana lives in the countryside, and the difference in the lilt and intonation of her words is apparent, even to me. She holds out her arms for Juni, and I pass our baby to her grandmother. As seems to be the universal human custom, Alamgana's voice changes to a higher pitch as she baby talks with Juni and rocks her exaggerating her own words and actions to draw a smile from my daughter. 
I take this opportunity to get up, use the bathroom, and get a glass of water from the kitchen. When I come back, the baby talk is still going and has veered into a different direction. When you get bigger, you'll make the coffee. Yes, yes, yes you will, you'll make the coffee. She's not even six months old, I say stiffly. Yes, but she's a girl and soon she'll be a big girl and girls make the coffee. Anger rises in me, my cheeks feel hot. My child is a blank slate. I haven't even started to imagine her future roles. I know her grandmother is talking to her with love, but I am enraged in this moment. Growing up in Nepal, I had my share of being told what girls should do and could do, and I've observed the same stultifying rigidity of gender roles in Ethiopia. That night, Elias and I talk before bed. In the darkness, I say to him, Elias, I don't want Juni to grow up with all these expectations about being a girl and what she can and can't do. I can't believe it's starting so early. She's just a baby. Anyhow, it's not about the coffee. I continue after a pause. I love making coffee. The second uh, little vignette here is when we're in New York um, and uh, I think it's self-explanatory, so I'll just go ahead with it. We celebrate our one year anniversary in New York, in New York City, by moving to a two bedroom apartment. It's a block away from the dollhouse where the three of us have been sleeping on a huge mattress on the floor. Our new apartment is sun drenched and gorgeous, but our first morning I'm awake at dawn, listening to the sounds of the garbage trucks, the buses, the cars and car alarms, and of course the sirens. Pros and cons, I think to myself. We are about to open Cafe Buni in the old shoe repair shop. The hanging shoe wind chime is now in the basement, a reminder of the space's past. In these final weeks of construction, Elias is busy, as always, with our Chinese contractor. He jokes he's starting to understand Chinese. He spends every day with them, not just overseeing, but helping, chatting, as they all eat takeout lunch from the restaurant on the corner. One afternoon, as we often do, Elias and I are standing outside the brown paper covered window at 213 Pinehurst Avenue. There are no benches yet, so we stand and gaze at the storefront, imagining what the future might hold for us. This afternoon, we are there with our star intern, B. B is an undergraduate at Barnard College and one of the most talented and creative people I have ever met. She's a hard worker and a pleasure to work with. I would hire her in a heartbeat. She designed our coffee gift cards and our coming soon poster that's on the window. Now we're talking about the sign outside our soon to be coffee shop. B thinks she can make the sign with stencils and gold spray paint. I love the idea of a homemade sign. As we're chatting, a woman I don't know stops in front of us. She looks directly at B. Hi, so excited about this place. Is it yours? When's it opening? B looks embarrassed. Um, actually, Serena and Elias here are the owners. She gestures towards us. The woman turns to us, slightly taken aback. Oh, hi. Well, good luck. We're excited. It's a small moment. This conversation lasts barely two minutes. I don't remember the woman's face anymore, but I have never forgotten this interaction. B was 17 years old and Elias and I were standing right there. Thank you. I love those selections that you chose. Um, when uh, Serena and I were talking about what, you know, prepping for this today, uh, we were talking about how many options there are in this excellent book, you know, so many great themes to draw from, but like this, this pairing of two um, excerpts in the book did stand out to me as well, and I'm so glad that you read from them. Do you want to uh, share a little bit about the background of coffee, coffee ceremony, the gender roles behind that for folks who aren't familiar, so they can understand yeah. that first one a little deeper? Yeah, sure. Um, so I grew up in a tea drinking culture. I'm from Nepal originally, and I really first discovered coffee when I lived and worked in Ethiopia. And it's a 
it's such a big part of daily life, of culture, of community, family there. And um, there's a traditional coffee ritual here. It would be called the coffee ceremony. And um, I lived in Ethiopia for almost eight years, seven and a half years. And in that time, I never once saw a man make coffee. Well, except for my husband. Um, which is in the book I, right before this. <laughs> I, I write about that in the book too. Yeah. It was a very specific circumstance. But it's really, um, the coffee ceremony is always performed by a woman. And so that's the context in which um, my mother-in-law was talking to my baby daughter about eventually growing up and making more coffee. And do you want to say a little bit about like, a little more about how you felt like unpack that last section of the excerpt like a little bit and then perhaps um you know bring it to the types of I don't know stereotypes that you have faced and bias that you and Elias have faced um in New York City and uptown sure you know I think that that it was such a small moment um but it I got so angry in that moment because it, it reminded me of so much of my childhood in a South, you know, I grew up with actually very um, open-minded parents, but a very conservative uh, extended family. So there was, there was uh, always this dynamic. I also have a brother, so I was acutely aware of the differences between how our extended family, the expectations and the rules that I would have versus what my brother would have. So, um, and, you know, gender roles are very, very defined in Nepal and in South Asian culture. So I think a lot, I, a lot it was a lot of that, too. Um, and in other parts of the book, you know, once we move here, I also am very attuned to those things that I encounter here, like um, with my daughters, you know, the being faced with this like sea of pink and blue for baby clothes right there's so many gorgeous colors in the world and yet everything seemed to be pink or blue and uh or you know i write a little bit about how i felt after um the kavanaugh hearings and the way that women's voices were being labeled hysterical or you know there were just so it's not i think that i try to there is also a stereotype the other way around, right? So people in the North, people in the United States often look at Ethiopia or Nepal and say, oh, those cultures, you know, mm -hmm. oh, how women are treated in those places. Mm -hmm. But it's very, you know, I, I wanted to also in different parts of the book be very clear that um, we are, it's very present here as well. Absolutely, I mean, you have said, um... And, I, and after this, I want to circle back to like the origins of this book and like what made you write it and all, all that. Um, but you do also write in the book because Booney now is such a, it's grown to such, such lengths, but it is still a small business. It is still an independent coffee house. Um, and you spoke about how a lot of independent coffee establishments are so white and so hipster, hipster um, led. It's, it's a little bit ironic or maybe not ironic that the people at the forefront, the faces of it, are not the people from the countries where the coffee is from. Um, so I don't know. I mean, like, how much does that still play a part in your business identity, your professional identity, um, any of that stuff? Yeah, there's definitely, um, there's definitely, like, there's a coffee hierarchy and there's a coffee world and specialty coffee, um, is deaf is it's still very white it's still very male um and this year like in a lot of different industries have have been looking at their own practices and the coffee world itself has also been grappling a lot with um how it shows up in the world and you know it's very connected you know co coffee is a commodity or you know i think it's more than a commodity but as it was traded um it has a very strong colonial history and so you can't really separate the coffee trade from colonialism and that still shows up in how in the hierarchy of coffee and who has the power who has the resources who grows it and who makes the most money off of it so um you know it's it's very interlinked but uh, i do write in the book you know when before we started buni elias and i were we were um you know we were very familiar with coffee from an ethiopian 
perspective, but learning about, well, New York, New Yorkers and coffee and how does a coffee shop in New York, um, how will that work? And we knew we couldn't just cut and paste the things we wanted to bring about Ethiopian coffee culture and community. We knew we couldn't just cut and paste that into New York. So how could we translate that here? Um, right. So we went, we did a lot of homework. We went to these trade shows. We went to, and everywhere it was very striking to us, right? It was very visible that who was talk, who was the expert? Mm. And, uh, and who was not the expert. <laughs> and it was really right. ironic to me that the people with the most lived experience of coffee were not the experts. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, it's a very, it's a live conversation even now in the coffee world. Yeah, definitely. Have you seen, I mean, last question on this before I go to the other thing. Have you seen any change since when you all founded the first Booney? Or like, I'll say even before, like before you had the brick and mortar, when you were really community-based, like going to the farmer's market and going to this festival in your neighborhood. Like, ha have you seen it evolve at all from then till now? The demographics and stuff? Def there's definitely evolution. I would say it's very slow. Mm. It's very slow. And, um, you know, recently with all of the um, attention on racial justice and, um, racial dynamics in the United States, there's been a big focus on black owned businesses. And uh, when you look at the list of black owned coffee shops, it's pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, even in the most diverse cities uh, right. in the United States. So it's, it's definitely, I'd say it's, has there been any change in the last almost 10 years? Yes, but is it, is it been slow? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let me back up a little bit. Uh, for those who, you know, may not know about the Coffee House Resistance, may not have read it yet, and may not know you so well, um, I'd love to hear about the first moment when you realized that you needed to write this book. Like, how did that happen? Um, what, you know, what motivated you? Um, so... I don't know that there was a moment where I realized I was going to write a book. Uh, I, it, as often things happen, it happened sort of by accident. Um, I was helping my dad work on his memoir. My mom and I had been nagging, basically, my dad for years that he had to write this book. And he had really resisted it until, until suddenly he was open to it. And he said, oh, well, maybe, you know, uh, if you'll help me. <laughs> So I was helping my dad with his memoir when I started writing this book. And I've always, I've always written for myself. So as a child, even I had a journal, I, you know, wrote privately, but, and I, you know, had written an article here or there, but nothing, never really more formally like this for, so, um, but when I was working with him on his book, um, just the little things I was jotting down and things I'd started working on, making them a little bit longer. He would take a break and, or he would, you know, yeah, he would need a break and I'd be like, oh, well, <laughs> I'm ready to go. So, um, and we were really fortunate. We had this amazing sort of father daughter time that we were doing a lot of, he was remembering a lot of his past and I was, you know, helping him, uh, with some of the collating and, and typing of things. And it also got me thinking um, mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah, his book, by the way, is out on Kindle now, or and ebook. And also um, his, the print, his print book is gonna come out October 6th. Oh, that's so great. Wait, what is it called? How can people find it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, so promoting my dad's book, it's called Fragments of Memory. A Nepali Nationals Reminiscences. And my dad is 80 years old and he has written his first book. So all of you, any of you in the audience <laughs> that are thinking of writing or are aspiring writers or are thinking like time is passing you by, uh, there he, you go. He wrote his first book at the age of 80. So I love that. Uh, and it's, you know, I'm biased, obviously. <laughs> it's a fantastic uh, story. He, he was he has lots of stories to tell and um yeah i suppose the apple doesn't fall far in that respect but i love it i love it so much um and i, I will say like in your book what is great is like 
the ever presence of like intergenerational community. Um, and I just so enjoy that, you know, you talk about your parents being in New York, you talk about um, being with different generations in Addis and, um, you know, just having, having people of all ages come to Buni for whatever political action community work you were doing there, um, which I will get to in a moment. So I think that's really cool. And we need more of that now, you know. Um, so I'm curious, because it's been about a year and a few months since, since the Coffee House Resistance first came out. Um, and as I said, the subtitle references desperate times. And sometimes I feel in 2020 as if I, I wish longingly that it was still 2019 even. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how like, if you went, like how do you feel about the book now? Like, are there thoughts about, is there anything you would have done or written differently if the book were written now for these times? How, I mean, I feel like it's also applicable now, but I'm curious to your thoughts. Yeah. It's a good question. I, I was, you know, rereading parts today in preparation of our conversation. And I did feel like, oh, well, it does resonate still now, even though it seems like so much, it feels like it was a decade ago, you know, when this book came out. You know, all those like in-person events and readings and yeah. shaking hands, <laughs> signing books, like how wonderful was that? <laughs> but, um, but this is wonderful too, you know, mm -hmm. I, so I think, yeah, I also was thinking about the subtitle, like little did I know, right? Uh, desperate times, like how, how much more so things were going to be. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to be writing it or rewriting it today, definitely, I think there are sections where I would look at myself now and say, look at myself then and say, wow, you know, you thought you were really uh, worldly and that you had your eyes wide open, but actually there was a lot of naive in there. <laughs> or there was a little bit of too much idealism in that, mm. comment, you know, like, oh, or a little bit of cringing at the way certain things maybe I would have said. Um, so maybe, maybe the book would be more radical if I wrote mm. it. You know, maybe it would be more on the unapologetically more radical maybe I don't know uh, mm -hmm. I it was yeah it's it's um I've often thought somebody said to me recently somebody who has read the book a friend of mine uh we were talking about the pandemic and and uh she said well there you go now you can write a sequel <laughs> yeah and it's like oh no <laughs> it, we're, yeah. all, we're all too in it right now I know it's um, it's it, some days just totally unbelievable. Other days it's like, of, of course, this is what would have happened. Um, but yeah, I, I can relate definitely to like looking at, back at something one has written and like that cringy feeling. <laughs> and also I feel like I'm getting more radical as I age. So also with you on that one, I want to shout out some people who've been in the chat, uh, say, singing their praises of you so that you're aware. Um, Unique was said early on, hi Serena, it's great to hear about your book. Jen, oh, Jen Ortiz, who's also a Word of Volunteer, um, was clapping and Arivi was uh, saying applause. Uh, we've got your dad's book's link in there. Um, and Dee Gittles really liked the story of how you started just writing the book out of helping your dad <laughs> with his memoir. Um, and says it's amazing that you and your dad have both written and published your books. Um, Sandra gave us like a hands up emoji and Rim says, as an inspiring writer, you and your dad are my inspiration. Um, oh, thanks everyone. That's really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So congratulations. One of the major parts of why I think Booney is such an incredible and special um, place is because of how you have managed to support community um, in how you all have uh, started and grown so I, I really wanted you to talk a little bit about how how that happened, you know, how you ended up having opening up the space to people, the customer takeover for sure, because I think the radical trust is like so awesome and it's so in line with, you know, Word Up as well, which is driven by a volunteer collective. Um, and Mary had asked in the chat if there's still community events held at Booney. So can you just answer both those at once, please? Thank you. I'll try. Um... <laughs> So, 
one of the fun, you know, one of the really fun things um, as I was writing the book was researching more about the history of coffee houses. And I found so much alignment between where Buni had ended up organically, just sort of blundered into, um, and the history of coffee houses, you know, throughout the world as being places where people gathered, where, where people uh, challenged sort of uh, status quo. Coffee houses were big places for literature and for politics for activism, and that's kind of where Buni had ended up. Um, right, right before uh, COVID uh, closures, we um, had just celebrated one year anniversary of our shop in Inwood, where we had a big customer community and customer supported Kickstarter campaign that outfitted the space with stage and lights and sound to allow us to have even more um, to be that gathering place. And um, I'd say we started off really small, you know, even with the Pinehurst uh, Buni, if anybody's been there, you know, it's a tiny, tiny space. Um, <laughs> but we, had variety. So great. we had variety shows, we had postcard writing campaigns, we had writing group, we had book club, we had all, and so um, a little bit uh, like what Tara was saying, we were really guided by the community that we were in and what people wanted. And as you know, coffee is mainly a daytime business, so evenings were wide open. And so, um, how could we how could we be in service to the community for the evening space and providing a space? So we we have had a wide eclectic range of events at Buni and. Um, we hope and really look forward to a time when we can gather in person again because um, a lot of our business identity is around that. Like the coffee had to be really, really good, but mm -hmm. it was much more about the people and the gathering yeah. and the, that was a really big part. And, and that, is, that is inspired by the coffee culture I was describing earlier about Ethiopia where um, Elias, my husband, and co-founder Ubuni will often say, like, in, in Ethiopia, like, it would be unthinkable to say, I'm going to have coffee. Like, what do you mean, I'm going to have coffee? <laughs> We're going to have coffee. Shall we have coffee? Let's have coffee. It's always in, in the group, right? Whether that group is your friends, your family, your neighbors, whoever it is. Um, so that was the idea behind Buni. It was really, it's kind of the opposite of what you would consider New York coffee, that coffee on the go, I just mm -hmm. want a bit of caffeine. Like, right. that's not what we were really all about. So, um, of course, you know, like most businesses, it's been a challenging time in that regard. But um, yeah, as I say, look forward to a time when it will be possible again and, and being open to different ways of doing things and mm -hmm. um, continuing that. But it's a really core part of our identity and a core yeah. part they write about in the book. Uh, absolutely, I mean, it's so clear. And we do have a Habesha contingent in the audience, I know, so they know all about the coffee um, and the importance of it and how weird it might seem to do it as a solo activity. <laughs> um, but so like, one, if people want to keep in touch and like know all the updates about Booney, how can they do that? Um, and then as we answer that, I'll remember what number two was because now it has escaped my brain. <laughs> So the, you know, follow us on social media. It's um, at Buni Coffee. Maybe I will put it in the chat because the, it's B-U-U-N-N-I, two U's, two N's, um, mainly because we thought maybe it, with the American pronunciation, we didn't want people to call us Bunny Coffee. <laughs> right. Well, wait, <laughs> did you even say what, why you chose, I loved how you talked in the book about how you chose the business name and why that. What so it's it a play off of words. So Buna in Amharic is coffee and Buni means brown. And so as we were just brainstorming names, um, I give myself credit for Buni's name because I was the one. That <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Elias, what about Buni? And I th thought that was really nice. Um, but it was also kind of an inside joke because of what we had talked about earlier, where we found the coffee scene to be so white. Yeah. Uh, the specialty coffee scene to be so white. So we're like, okay, let's just call ourselves yeah. brown. Right. I <laughs> um, love that. We'll be the so brown much. cafe, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, I love it. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, I think, you know, I'd probably have to turn it over in a moment, but I, I would really love if you could tell us about the customer takeover, because I really do think that was so cool um, for people who don't know. Thank you. It was pretty cool. Um, and like most things, it just sort of one thing led to another. Um, one of our very regular uh, customers and friends um, and I were chatting in Buni and I was saying, oh, I think we should close the shop for a day and take the staff to the beach. You know, everybody's working hard and we don't ever have a chance to all be together because um, people work in shifts. There's a morning shift and an afternoon shift. So it's hard for everybody to be together at the same time. Like it's even hard to have a meeting. Um, but it was summer and we wanted to go to the beach and we wanted to take everybody to the beach. It was a couple of years ago. And um, so she, she just said, well, maybe you don't have to close the shop. Maybe, you know, maybe we could look after it. We'd babysit Booney. And, and I, so that's how it started. And it actually became a thing. So it ended up with a Google sheet with sign up volunteers who wanted to sign up for which hour of looking after Booney. And, you know, I write in the book about how I didn't feel weird about it at all because by this time we had been open for five years and the people who were, you know, enthusiastically volunteering were all people we saw pretty much every day or every other day and they weren't strangers, right? right. So it wasn't like leaving your shop in the hands of strangers. And um, so we had more volunteers than we needed, but we still gave everybody a shift. and. Um, I, some of you will remember uh, DNA Info was a news site mm -hmm. that often had really specific local coverage. So um, Carolina uh, at DNA Info did the first story about this, and it was the day before our customer takeover. And in the morning, we agreed we were just going to set up, and then we literally piled into our minivan and drove to the beach, was the plan. Um, but then all this media showed up in the morning and they wanted to cover the story and it just, it became much bigger than, um, but when we came, it, it went off beautifully. Like the, we went to the beach, we had a great day. Mm -hmm. Our customers took good care of the shop. Um, and it was just one of those, and I, I call it in the book, it was like an exercise in radical trust and love. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, a lot, of, a lot of businesses talk about their customers as community. And mm -hmm. to me, this was a real sort of demonstration of that community, that there was this mutual mutuality in it. And, um, and it was built on that relationship. So that was our, our customer takeover. I love that so much. And I know I'm not alone because Ewen is in the chat saying how inspiring <laughs> that is, the trust, the community, the enthusiasm. She put a heart there. Derek is like, yeah. Veronica says, well, from before, she loves the, the story about how you came up with the name Booney. So I think I have to um, stop asking you questions now, but if you are interested and you haven't already gotten your copy of The Coffee House Resistance, Brewing Hope in Desperate Times by Serena Pravasi, please do yourself a favor and get a copy unless you already want a copy uh, by being one of the first five to register. Um, it's a really, really good read. I loved getting lost in it. And thank you so much, Serena, for sharing all of this with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And in addition, in addition to it being a great read, also, if you were not one of the first five people who got a free copy, the proceeds of this, of the additional sales, will go to supporting the Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights, um, which Veronica just linked in the chat. So you can learn more about that organization. And so a great book and also a great cause. So I would we can we can marry those two um yes yeah, so thank you thank you thank you so much to uh serena and to cynthia for interlocuting um and now i believe veronica will be introducing ruthie valdez our featured artist for today Oop, sorry i'm muted ruthie um Ruthie's great. There's so many things I could have said. It. I could have asked for an official bio, but I forgot to. Uh, that's okay, because Ruthie's a painter and illustrator. She's uh, a mom to many, many kids, <laughs> I think beyond her own. Um, we got to know each other because she was the teaching artist um, 
for Urban Arts Partnership, which uh, works at PS 132. And through this initial event we did, um, where she came to us and said, I want to put up a gallery show, like an art show of all of my students. Um, but then, you know, get them beyond that to knowing the store and would bring them in every week. You know, there were so many student works displayed that not everybody could fit at once. So she broke everyone up into segments and had them come in and had their parents and siblings come in and then just got whole families involved with knowing the bookstore. And then the next year did that same art show, but in like 10 different community organizations and 10 different community venues. And um, then just really brought these students into the life of the community and the community, you know, to knowing like what, what the thoughts and feelings were of um, the students as they were being expressed through the poetry that they read and the questions they asked each other and just, just seeing them all follow out around for me <laughs> is like the greatest sight. Um, and, but then there was this one time that we had this like gap before we had their show go up. And so we said, well, what if Ruthie, you do a show too? And like instantly Ruthie had put together this amazing show that um, of her own work up at Word Up, which we hadn't had before and which we hadn't had like exposure to all at once. And it was also just like an amazing, delight <laughs> to have that and have it be in conversation with the student work once the student work went up um and i know that she's done other you know salons for artists gatherings and stuff and um you, you have a more official bio i know somewhere and i'm sorry that i forgot to ask for it but um i i'm very inspired by what you do on a day-to-day -day basis in the community and uh, i'm excited that you will show us for yourself and hopefully share just, you know, your own <laughs> thought behind the work you do. And then we'll raffle off with the salad spinner um, and our work. Can't wait to see who's gonna win. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, I'm a surrealist artist. I've been painting for 21 years now. I've been teaching for five. It's, um, I kind of stumbled, I started teaching part-time and fell in love. It became, it was so easy. The kids loved me, I loved them. It was just, it's what I was supposed to do. It just kind of fell into it. Um, but a surrealist, as a surrealist, what I do is I have, I kind of expose the subconscious mind. I have a lot, I have the ability to lucid dream and I get flashes of images that I see in my head. It's really bizarre. I don't know. I just get these images and then I'll start painting them. Sometimes I see the whole image, sometimes I see a little bit of image. So I'm going to show you guys one where I only saw one figure and that's all I can paint. And I left it alone for like six months and then it's, the second part of the image came to my head and I was like, oh, and then I just started painting. So for example, this one here is called, it's called alchemical, alchemical entanglement. It has nothing to do with, um, nothing to do with the Will Smith, Jada Pickett stuff. This was done in 2017. Um, so I kind of, I play with the whole, this is a love, a love romance, kind of play with the whole entanglement of, you know, male, in the mass, in the feminine, a lot of symbolism with the, with the moth, um, the briefcase here. So it's more, I have more of an intimate conversation with the viewer. A lot of the people that see my work, they look at it and they cannot just walk past it because it's kind of it's talking to them really loudly. And they're like, this painting is talking to me. What is it saying? Um, that's how I met Tara many, 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 many years ago was through a painting that spoke to her. And then we became the bestest of friends um yeah this is one and this is the one that someone's gonna take home today so i don't know what else to say <laughs> i want to just answer one question the question was where do i teach i teach creative writing and visual arts to english language learners um all the way from second i'm teaching second and fifth grade now but i can i've taught high school middle school um, so just kind of get kids to learn a new language using fun things like art. Um, we write a lot of poetry, a lot of poetry in Spanglish to try to get them to acquire. That's what I, I found that if I let them use Spanglish, a little bit of Spanish with a little bit of English they've learned, and we start piecing it together and then we create poetry out of it. But then they feel more comfortable saying those English words and replacing the Spanish ones a little bit at a time. All right, thanks so much for presenting and um, congratulations to Layla. 
Um, are there any more questions for for anyone here? What do you, uh, what do you love most about teaching? Do we just that was it. What do I love most about teaching? That I learn as well. Like if as a teacher, I come in with very zero, like I'll come in as is a collaboration. So the child teaches me a lot of things. My Spanish was horrible before I started teaching. So I've learned a lot. I acquire my Spanish a lot, it's a lot better because I learn from them. So I kind of, I let them teach me things. I learn about Roblox. <laughs> I love the, the, they keep me youthful. They keep me in the know of what's going on with the youth. I think that the children's voice or are the most honest and if you want to know what's going on in society all you got to do is listen to the kids and they'll tell you because they're 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 experiencing life through a different perspective and they're pretty honest so that's what i love about teaching cool um does anyone have any oh what we have more questions coming in um what are some of your more what are one of the more challenging moments you've had um I'm assuming while teaching, um, but I guess you could open up to, as an artist, as a teaching well, artist. Difficult, there is a lot of difficult, um, a lot of challenging moments. This year has been very challenging. Um, the, the kids, they missed a lot of things. They couldn't graduate normally. They were looking forward to graduation. They were looking forward to the senior trip. Um, that was very challenging was to be able to break, to tell them have to tell them like we're not there's not going to be a normal graduation and having to see them cry and that was pretty challenging um because we had a lot of plans we had the i am tour like veronica was saying this, this was my third year um and we had different locations we were booked on and practice and we were very excited we had a lot of plans we published our second book this year um that was pretty hard was to see those little hearts you know break with a lot of the things that we cannot do no field trips. <laughs> oh, that was very hard. I forgot that you that you've also made books with these students. There, it's in another room. Otherwise, I would display it here. But um, I have the, it here somewhere. Oh yeah, it's it's the work of the the, the poetry of the students, um, plus the artwork sprinkled throughout. And then at the end, it's recipes that the parents have contributed. Um, you know, huh? recipes that that I've also tried to make now. <laughs> Thanks for having the book. Where can people obtain that book? This book is not for sale yet. There's a lot of um, legal stuff behind it. We're working on it, um, especially now after COVID, we're working on releasing it so the funds go straight to the school. Um, but this is an awesome book, yeah, it's, a, it's an awesome book. Um, okay, so one last question here is, um, what's, it, what's it been, you know, are you able to, have you been able to teach children online? Yes. Um, and been, how's that gone? I've been teaching remotely. Um, I give them classes via the computer. Um, it's going okay. I mean, they love it. They, they, I, I decided to teach. I was supposed to take vacation. I decided to teach during the summer because they were like, we need to see you. What are we going to do? The reality is that a lot of these kids have nothing to do. They're home, stuck at home. And I, they were happy to see me, even if it was for an hour. Um, so I was like, yes, as long as you guys want to see me, we're going to do this. Um, but I've been remote. It's, um, it's, it's okay. I think it, we were all thrown into remote teaching. There was no warning. There was no training or of any sort. Um, I believe we did really well. Jumped in, you know, um, gave a lot of good, um, good stuff to them. So we became closer as a school. We became much more closer. We had no choice. Um, I think I wanted to just mention one thing you let me know about um, an agreement that you made among staff with each other at the school. Um, I think it was when I was contacting you about one of the marches and I'd forgotten something and you told me, Ruthie, that everyone is, this, this whole time is such an unprecedented time and everyone's heads are so scattered that you really made an explicit agreement among the staff that you work with that to just like 
if anything forgotten is like forgiven. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to some extent, I think there was, I can't remember exactly what it was that you said, but it was, um, it like stuck with me as like something that just sort of needs to be across the board that um, that that patience just needs to be there. Yeah, I think it was more like we made it just keeping the student, everything kind of centered around the child, the student, the kids, um, and then everything else would fall into place. We just became more open to whatever happened in the past days in the past. We have to be here for our community, for our students. Uh, we all went live. Not all the schools decided to live to do live classes, um, which is pretty sad. But we all agreed to go live um, so the kids can see us at different times throughout the day. All right. Well, I think um, we could wrap it up here. Um, thanks so much to everyone who's joined us, uh, everyone in the audience to Ruthie for sharing your work and yourself um, and to Tara um, and telling us about the genesis of Hilltop um, Park Ale House, which is the corner of 159th and Broadway. To Serena, um, our, our featured author, author of the Coffee House Resistance, um, whose book is available um, at wordupbooks.com and proceeds of which will go to Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights. Um, you can also visit one of the four Boonie coffees, um, either at the GW Bridge Terminal, um, on Pinehurst, in Riverdale, and um, in Inwood on Broadway. Um, and thanks so much also to Cynthia um, for your amazing questions. Congratulations also on your own book. Um, thank you for letting me peer pressure you to potentially do more of a launch coming soon, um, since this week is pub week for your own book. Um, but thank you for taking the time to, um, you know, prepare questions and moderate the, the book portion of this event. And thanks again to Jackie and to L'Oreal um, from Cloth for, for setting up the infrastructure for all of this. And uh, thanks to Memphis, uh, who, who's here and who uh, will also be introducing the next event. Our next um, Cloth book talk book series event will be September 5th at... 4.30 p.m. Um, it's a different time than usual, but it's a it's a kids event. So we're lining it up with the story time that we've had um, on Saturdays. Um, and that is for a book called MC Veggie Fresh Rocks the Mic. Uh, maybe Ruthie, some of the students or kids you know would want to go, but it's um, it's all it's a, it's a picture book. It's all about healthy food and it's written by um, a nutritionist and dietitian. Um, who is from Harlem and it's, it's a fun book. Um, and we will do some activities that will be really interactive and that's next Saturday, uh, 4.30 p.m. So if you wanna register for that event, there's a, you can look online at wordupbooks.com slash events um, and you can register for that event there. Thank you so much everyone.